Hi there, everyone. Greg Marchand here again with the virtual instructor-led training program brought to you by the Service Sales Academy. In this program, I'm going to talk to you about understanding the diagnostic process. It kind of goes along with the technical knowledge for service advisors series. My thought was we've, we've talked about selling diagnostics, but maybe just a little bit more in depth on what the actual processes are that technicians follow might help you to create value with the customers when you're selling the diagnostic process. Because one of the challenges in selling diagnosis, of course, is that we're selling something different. It's a totally different animal here. We're selling research rather than a part, rather than, than something tangible that a customer can see. And, and they, don't, they don't necessarily know what diagnosis is. They're used to buying a product. So the more you know about the diagnostic process, the more you can speak to this process, and the more confidence you'll have, and that confidence is gonna help you sell diagnostics. So this won't take very long, okay? Because it's just, it's high level diagnostic theory with, with a little bit of a drill down here. The diagnostic theory generally goes like this. Time is what we sell. And the less time it takes me to diagnose something, the happier everybody is, right? Customer's happy because the convenience was, was you know, increased. We had their car for fewer days, fewer hours. Maybe it costs them less. You're happier because you've got an answer sooner and you can sell whatever repair it is we need to sell. The technician's happy because they're highly productive now. Good diagnosis follows a logical process in order to be really efficient. And in that logical process, every next step is based on the results of the last step. Not following a process means things are gonna take longer. And this can come down to a skill set thing, all right? The example I use is, is we give a less experienced technician a more difficult diagnostic process and, and they don't know what the process is. They're not familiar with the process. And so instead of following the steps in the book, they take what they do know and they jump around from step to step. They didn't follow the process. Next thing you know, they get six hours into it and they are nowhere. Diagnostic theory involves process. We follow a process, it takes us less time. The more we follow a process, the better we get at the process. The quicker we get at the process, the less time it takes. In general, diagnostic process is this. We observe the symptoms of whatever it, whatever it might be. This is a general process. We observe symptoms, we determine if there's anything else related to whatever we've just observed. We take some measurements. Maybe these are actual physical measurements. In the case of uh, measuring radial runout on a, on a wheel for a vibration diagnosis. Maybe it's a, an electrical measurement. For a check engine lights on, we have a code for an O2 sensor and we're actually gonna put an oscilloscope on the O2 sensor and look at the electricity involved in the operation. We take those measurements, we compare those to known good values. So we observe, we observe if there's anything related, we take measurements, we compare measurements to known good values, and then based on those measurements and the known good values, we know what's right, we know what's not right, and we isolate the problem. That's the general diagnostic approach for just about any problem on an automobile the customer is going to bring us. Now, let's drill down a little bit here, and here is a a mill diagnostic process. This is the process that I taught for, for many, many years. And it's, it's mostly still pertinent today. There might be a few nuances now that, that have changed a little bit. But what I would teach technicians is this. Get all your information. You know, they would, go, they would want to go on a test drive. And, and I'm in a shop one day, and, and I've been teaching this and teaching this. And, and I, see, I, I saw the repair order get written. I knew what was on it. I saw it get dispatched to the technician. The technician gets it, it says check engine light on. The technician goes and grabs a scan tool, pulls a code, and starts to back out of the bay. And I walked up to him and I said, hold on a sec, where are you going? He says, I'm going for a test drive. I said, why? He says, to see what it does. I said, okay, what do you know so far? He says, well, I plugged the scan tool in and I have a code, XYZ, whatever it was. I said, okay, so what are you looking for in a test drive? He says, I just see if it acts up. And then what are you going to do? You're going to come back and you're going to go pull some information. And once you get the information, you're going to go for another test drive. This is not productive. 
and he was all grumpy with me. But my point is, get all the appropriate information first. Get everything you think you're gonna need. And that means as a service advisor, you need to gather information from the customer first and get all that information to the technician. Repair history, customer information, you know, how long has it been doing it? When did it first act up? Use the customer problem analysis sheet we'll talk about. The technician's gotta, gotta gather whatever information he or she can, pull all the codes, and I don't care if they, they do the first two steps here in that order or not, if they wanna flip flop them, that's fine. They're gonna pull diagnostic trouble codes with the scan tool, they're gonna pull any data the scan tool may have, have stored for them. They're gonna write that stuff down or they're gonna print it out. They're gonna save it somehow. They'll save it in a file on the laptop, that's fine as well. Once they have all of that, then go test drive it to see if you can duplicate the condition. Because now you know what you're looking for. You got all the information. Now go for the test drive to see what, see what, what it does. Because now that you understand the system and what it thinks it saw, now you got something to look for on the test drive. Mode six is, is too technical to get into here and, and mode six isn't, eh, it's not widely used anymore. Um, there's some kind of challenges with it today that make it not as, as awesome a tool as it, we used to think it was. But that's beside the point. Sometimes we teach them to use mode six, sometimes we won't. We teach them to use custom data lists so they can create their own data lists so with certain functions that, that they want to observe because it's measurements that mean something to them as it relates to whatever turn the check engine light on. We teach them to use multimeters. We teach them to use oscilloscopes. We teach them to use all kinds of specialized equipment to isolate the problem. Once we have the information, we've seen the car do its thing, we've used the scan tool to the best of our ability to narrow down where we think the concern is, now we actually test for electrical signals and or system failures using very specific tools to isolate the problem. At that point, we bring it back to you, the service advisor, you sell the repair, we do the repair, and then we confirm the repair as a technician. And we always test drive. Now look, sometimes test driving to confirm a repair when it comes to a check engine light is very time consuming. I won't get into it here, but there are differences of opinion as to whether you can pay for that or charge for that or not. Some shops will say to the customer, here, drive it, let us know if the light comes back on. Some shops will give the, the consumer a, a tool to determine readiness. They plug it into the OBD2 connector and they say, bring this thing back to us when all the lights are off. Still others say, look, you know what? You pay us to fix your car. Yeah, we're gonna charge you an extra hour for this test drive, but we're gonna charge an extra hour. We're gonna go do the test drive. And we're gonna make sure your car is right. Three ways of looking at it. But you can see the general mill diagnostic process that technicians will follow in diagnosing the check engine light. Now, if you jump around, if you try to isolate the trouble before you go for a test drive, before you have any information, you're just gonna waste a bunch of time. These are in this order for a reason. But look deeper in this. Look at the specialty equipment involved. Look at the specialty skill sets involved. The, the hours of training, the hours of experience that go into this. This is why when I sell diagnostics, I say to the customer, what you're paying for is our diagnostic specialist with all of his tools or her tools and knowledge to identify exactly what the problem is with your automobile so we get it fixed right the first time and you don't waste any more time bringing your vehicle to us. There's a lot they've got to know. Let's look at a noise or vibration concern. Here's a diagnostic flow for a noise or vibration concern. Again, what's it start with? Customer information. Your job, that's your job. You play a really, really important part in the diagnostic process. You can use the customer problem analysis sheet. Maybe the vehicle history has something to do with it, but you've gotta get that information for the technician. And then the technician's expected to go verify the concern. If they have to test drive with the customer, they need to test drive with the customer. Maybe it's sometimes you that's gonna test drive with the customer. But either way, we've gotta know the concern or we cannot fix anything. Technicians are taught, if you can't verify it, do not fix it. Because you don't know what the heck you're doing. You're just throwing parts at it. You can't diagnose something that you haven't seen the condition of yet. And then with vibrations and noises, we teach them, look, eliminate the quick and simple things first. If it's a wheel vibration, check wheel balance. Rotate the tires. 
Take some, take some physical measurements. Eliminate the quick, simple things first. Now, I could take this even further and talk about vibration analysis, which is a tool they can use to actually measure vibration, and then they can pull a drive shaft out, or they can rotate tires, and they can measure it again. So they have some measurement tools that they can then take those measurements and compare them to known good measurements. So this diagnostic process is very similar to that general diagnostic process. Observe the symptoms, take measurements, compare the measurements against known good, and eliminate what's good till you get to the part that you know is bad now. One more, how about electrical diagnostic process? Again, verify the complaint. If you can't verify it, don't fix it. There's that, it's a waste of money for everybody. Their time, our money, customers' money. Don't try to fix it if you can't verify it. Determine related symptoms. Okay, yeah, I can see the problem. The light's not working. Is there anything else not working? Push the buttons, turn the knobs. See what else does and doesn't work. Don't forget to check the information that was provided. Check the repair history. Check the service history. Are there any clues in there as to what might have gone on here? Because if you do that down bottom, and some will check technical service bulletins last. I don't. Grab those first. They're not a fix. They're not a diagnosis. But they're something to consider. And if I get them up front, I can consider it in the first part of the process rather than last one. I just don't know what's going on. Oh, maybe I'll check TSBs. Why don't you check those up front? Not as a diagnosis, but as another piece of information. And once you have all that information and you understand the symptoms and the related symptoms, now you can analyze them. Anything connected? Anything in common? What tools are we going to use to isolate the trouble? Okay? And once you isolate the trouble, then you repair it and you verify your repair. You can start to see how all the diagnostic processes are very, very similar. There are different tools involved and maybe, maybe different specific processes in terms of measurement involved. But they start with verifying the concern, gathering information, taking measurements, comparing measurements to, to known good measurements, and isolating the problem to the point where we understand, hey, this is where the problem is. Let's confirm it's not working. Yep, it's not working. Now I know what the vehicle needs. Now we can bring it to the service advisor and you've got something to sell. Okay, so talk to your customers about these processes. Now, what goes wrong with the process? Too many things, unfortunately. Maybe the complaint's misunderstood. We have bad communication between the service counter and the customer. Not that that's ever happened. Maybe it's bad communication between the customer and the customer's spouse. I've seen that happen. All right, it's a misunderstood complaint. That can throw the diagnosis and productivity right out the window, right? So let's make sure we understand the complaint. Maybe we can't verify the complaint. Again, poor information. We don't, we don't know what the complaint is or how to duplicate the complaint. Maybe the technician has the wrong skill set. Maybe they, maybe they don't adhere to the process. Maybe they don't know the process. Maybe their measurement techniques are poor. Maybe they've never learned them. Maybe they don't know how to use the tools. Maybe they don't know how to interpret the data that they have for measuring. These are all skill set issues. If you want to avoid the challenges, the biggest thing you can do is communicate. I'll show you the example of the customer problem analysis sheet in just a second, but use it. Use it to gather information. Because if you can ensure communication, you're going to get rid of half, if not more, of the communication, I'm sorry, of the diagnostic challenges that you face in the shop. If you can ensure dispatch the right technician, right job, right technician, you got something. And if you can have a plan for when things do go wrong, you can avoid making the challenges compounded. Let's talk about communication real quick. Have the, use the technician, have the technician talk to the customer if necessary. Sometimes the three of you need to have a conversation. I teach that a lot in classes. Make sure you as a service advisor understand the complaint and relay that properly to the technician. Get as much information as possible from the customer and relay all of that to the technician. Don't determine what they need and don't need. Get it all. Even go so far as to ask the technician what would be helpful to know. Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, can, can you give me like two minutes to go ask the technician if there's anything I should be asking you about this just to make sure that we don't take too much of your time later on? They'll say okay. You, know, you can even ask a technician, how much, how much time do you think I should start with to diagnose something like this? I do an hour is plenty. Uh, I'd start with an hour. 
Two totally different things, right? Either way, you're gonna sell an hour, but the first one, boom, you know they're gonna nail it pretty quick. They're that confident, or 99% of the time they will. The second time, you know this might be a little more challenging. It helps you prepare your, your sales diagnostic process, right? When you're, when you're, what you're gonna prepare the customer for. Here's a customer problem analysis sheet. I know it's too much of an eye chart, um, but it's available on the Service Sales Academy website at servicesalesacademy.com as a download. Use it. I don't care how much experience you have in the industry. I don't care how long you've been a service advisor. Use the customer problem analysis sheet to gather information. It'll help you remember to ask questions that maybe you'll forget because you're busy. It'll, re it'll, it'll remind you to collect data that, that maybe you wouldn't have thought to ask. And at the very bottom of it, there's a question that I think is really, really important. And that says, is there anything, no matter how crazy it may sound, that you associate with this concern? That's the catch-all. That's the, hey, what else are you not telling us that's not on this form? Is there anything else that we really need to know here? And you'd be amazed at how much information you'll glean from that one little question. So use it. Use it to improve the diagnostic process for your technicians. Right tech, right job, right dispatch, really, really important. Watch the dispatching repair order video. All right, it talks more in depth about dispatching jobs. Communicate to the technician how much time has been sold for this diagnostic job. Generally, I want you to sell an hour. Some of you are selling it by diagnostic process. You've got tier one, tier two, tier three diagnosis, and you're, you're selling these packages. That's fine too. There, there's a, a lot of discussion ongoing in the industry right now about what's best for selling diagnosis. Um, and and it's, a, it's an ongoing debate, and it's a really, really good debate. And it's a great one to have right now. But for right now, communicate how much time you've sold the customer. So do I have to let you know after an hour? Do I have to let you know after two hours? Communicate with a shop foreman if you have a shop foreman. If, if I hand Johnny Q Technician a job and I'm thinking, oh boy, this might be over their head, I'm going to go tell my shop foreman, hey, listen, Joe, I, I gave Johnny this job. I, he's the only tech we had available right now. Just keep an eye on him. Okay? Communicate, communicate, communicate. I cannot emphasize that enough. And have a plan. Have a plan for when things go wrong. This four-step diagnostic plan, um, again, is available as a download on servicesalesacademy.com or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to provide it to you. It's, it's a catch-all for when things don't go well. It's, hey, look, you know what? You follow the basic diagnostic process. Here's the things that you do. If you get to this point and you don't move on, you don't have a solution, a resolution, then you need to do X, Y, Z. And that moves to step two. And here's step two. Here's what's going to go on in step two. And if you have a formal documented plan like this, you can also use it to sell diagnostics to customers. You can say, look, here's our process. Most of the time we get everything done in step one. That's that first hour you're paying for. If we get to that first hour and, and, and we can't get there, here's what's going to go on in step two. This is the second hour you're going to pay for. And you can have something tangible to show the customer. So consider it. Great diagnosticians combine their experience with the measurement results. They really do understand the value of process though. And they keep up to date on techniques. And they practice, 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 practice. And they ask questions. And they gather information. And they're always looking for faster ways of doing things. Especially faster ways of diagnosing problems. Leverage all of these things. You've got a great diagnostician in your shop somewhere. Support them. Get them information. Ask them questions. Make sure they stay in the process. Or ask them what the process is so that you can explain that to the customer. I know it sounds like a lot of work. Why don't, look, instead of going through all this, why don't we just look, yeah. You and I both know that most of the time this is just an O2 sensor. I'm just gonna sell an O2 sensor, let's go from there. Or, you know what, let's just clear that code and let the customer drive it for a while. Okay. Could you do it that way? Sure you could. It's not diagnosis, for one. It's guessing. And it's going to cost the customer a lot more time in the long run. Paying for research might sound silly. It might sound expensive. But it's better to know what we need and get it right the first time. There's value in that. There's convenience value in that. Because if we guess wrong, the convenience gets affected. So let's not guess. Because it can get expensive if we just keep guessing. So let's sell diagnostic process, let's understand process, and let's support the process. Now let's get more cars fixed right the first time. 
Process includes observation of symptoms, what symptoms are related, measuring, and then comparing those measurements to known good values. That's analysis, right? And if we understand the general process our technicians follow, we're going to be able to better sell diagnosis. But I really think that understanding the diagnosis process in general will really help you convey the value to your customers of that money they're about to spend, the, the $80, $160, the whatever it is they're about to spend for diagnosis because it's going to save them time. Time is convenience to them. Time is money to us. And it's going to increase your customer satisfaction levels at your repair shop. Folks, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Give me a phone call. And until next time, keep up the great work and never stop learning.